Good morning to you this morning. Delighted that you're here, as I mentioned before. It's always nice this time of year. Thanksgiving, to me, is one of the best times of the year. Is it for you? To give my thanks to God for everything that he has done and to offer our gratitude and heart. If I were free, if I were free is actually part of a song. It says, if I were free to speak my mind by Travis Edmondson. And he wrote this song. And Peter, Paul, and Mary, during the 60s, they sang this song as on their second or third album. I can't remember which one. Um, but as a young man, as in, in uh, high school, I loved listening to Peter, Paul, and Mary. More than the Beatles. Can you believe that? I like Peter, Paul, and Mary, like the folk tunes and songs. And in this particular song, or if it was part of what we might call a protest song, and during that time they were protesting the Vietnam War. And here's Peter, Paul, and Mary singing, singing from the Lincoln Steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, there on the great, great day when they had thousands and thousands of people show up for that, if I were free. And the words go like this. If I were free to speak my mind... I tell a tale to all mankind of how the flowers do bloom and fade, of how we fought and how we paid. This weary world has had its fill of words of war on every hill. The time has come for peaceful days and peaceful men of peaceful ways. When all mankind has ceased to fight, I'll raise my head in thanks each night. For this rich earth, and all it means, for golden days and peaceful dreams. Here I am uh, standing, do you know where I'm standing there? I'm at the Vietnam Memorial, Vietnam War Memorial. And it's rather touching for me to stand there and found my, one of my classmates from college name on the wall. I'll never forget when he was uh, drafted and went off to the war. And... um, the day that we got word that he had been killed, and there the flag was at half staff at our school. Very sober for us in the dormitory who had lived down the hall from him, and to find his name on the wall, um, there was uh, quite touching for me that experience. And so, therefore, the protest songs that were coming out against the war meant a lot. If I were free to speak my mind, I'd tell a tale to all mankind. Of all the flowers that do bloom and fade, and how we fought, and how we paid. It was kind of a falling right up in there was the summer after I got to college, after my first year, was the summer of love at Haight-Ashbury. Some of you are old enough to remember this. Some of you that are in your 80s and 90s. Uh, <laughs> remember, remember this. I was in college, and I went down to Haight-Ashbury. I had never experienced the flower children before. But they were, everybody was saying peace to everyone and flowers, and they were putting flowers in their hair. It was quite an interesting thing to witness down at the Haight-Ashbury area in San Francisco. And so I was quite fascinated by this movement, of which I never became a part. And when I was down there, I was dressed as I would in college, but I looked so out of place with everybody else with their long hair and beards and beads and all barefooted and everything. It was amazing contrast to me to see what was taking place. Some of you remember this. Some of you are way, way, way too young. But the question you might ask is, well, where is the peace? We had that great peace movement, but there is no peace. No peace anywhere. I uh, was curious to know how many wars are going on right now. So I went to the source of all great knowledge, and that would be Google. And I asked, currently there are 10 active wars and 8 active military conflicts going on right now around the world. Wars and military. So 18 things struggling within our world happening right now that are going on. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. No peace. This has been some time since 1967 when the summer of love and the summer of peace and Peace movement and everything, and yet, there is no peace. John Lennon, if you remember the late Beatle, um, John Lennon, he had a song, and they would sing this song, it was called, about all we are saying is give peace a chance. Isn't that a good theme? 
All we are saying is give peace a chance. And that seems like that's a good thought, a good thing, a good happening. And we're singing a lot and we can make it all go, but it doesn't change anything, does it? It doesn't change anything. But the words of Jesus, I think, are fascinating. The words of Jesus, as he spoke in Matthew 24, he said, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And basically we're saying there is no peace. There is no peace. In fact, since Cain killed Abel, we've had no peace. Isn't that right? Oh, there have been areas of the country, areas of the part where we live in peace. There be parts where we say that. But there seems to be within the human nature the constant conflict that goes back and forth and rages. Constant contact. Constant conflict. Constant difficulty. Constant condemnation of others. Persecution. And if we keep thinking about it on this Thanksgiving weekend, it can get pretty depressing. Really depressing, can it not? Really depressing to have happen. So as I've been thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, the pilgrims. The pilgrims are an interesting group. They came and arrived at Plymouth Rock in 1620. I've visited Plymouth Rock. Maybe you have as well. Gone down there to see what the pilgrims and where they landed. They're in Massachusetts. And so I was there, and I've been thinking about them since and so forth. Why did the pilgrims leave England? The reason they left England was because they were being persecuted by the Church of England. You had to be in the Church of England. You had to believe as the Church of England believed, the Anglican Church. You had to be a follower of that, or it was rough sailing for you. And so eventually they said, let's get out of here. Let's go to the New World. And so they went to America, and there they came. The pilgrims came, so grateful they arrived, many of them sick and dying. They came, and they sought religious freedom. And very quickly, the pilgrims began to persecute those who disagreed with them. Unfortunately, now they're going to conflict. Religion can be an incredibly struggle between people, can it not? Right now, we have Muslims and, uh, and Christianity. Difficult, difficult. If you've been paying attention, you've seen that Christianity is under attack. It's under attack everywhere. All right, this morning... I'd like you to open your Bibles, if you would, with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Now, what is fascinating about this particular passage and this particular part of Isaiah is Isaiah, was particular part we're going to look at, has been borrowed by Christianity and made into a hymn. You may have it in your Bible as poetry, part of it, that we are going to look at in Isaiah. You may have that particular part there, and it may be in poetry fashion, and you'll see that it is centered and looks like poetry in chapter 9. But Isaiah, when he wrote this, when Isaiah was writing, he actually had not divided. There is no division between chapter 8 and chapter 9. And in chapter 8, he's been telling about all the distress Israel is going through. All the problems, all the attacks, all things. And he gets down to chapter 9, and all of a sudden, he begins by saying to us, Nevertheless, no matter all that distress and all that problems I've just outlined in chapter 8, nevertheless, at the end of this, this is what I want you to say. And here comes the word of the Lord. Therefore, nonetheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephi. Those were two of the areas that came and Babylon overtook. They were two that came and fell to the Babylonians. But in the future, he went on, you will honor Galilee. He will honor, excuse me, honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. And the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness. Now I think this is quite fascinating because Paul offers to us, For God who said, let the light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus. 
that the light that we saw was proclaimed in the face of Jesus. Now, I've been thinking about this light shining in the darkness. Wasn't that interesting that the wise men followed the light, the star? They were following a light. Isn't that interesting? That led them to Jesus, to the birth of Jesus. It's quite fascinating that they would have that. And Isaiah is talking about this. Out of the darkness would come this. Out of the darkness they would come. From a land that did not honor them. We'll talk more about that coming the Christmas season. Verse 3. Isaiah 9 verse 3. You, the Lord, have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people at the harvest, as warriors rejoice in dividing the plunder after the victory. For it is the day of the Median's defeat. You have sheltered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressors, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Now, we usually don't read those parts. We usually skip that part. But it sets up what is coming. And that part, chapter 8, of all that depression stuff, of the struggle of Israel, and the problems they have. And now in chapter 9, he begins, he says, Nevertheless, things are going to change. And then he reveals that great passage to us. It brings us joy. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, the government of God. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, notice that, Prince of Peace. Of the garments of his government, of the greatness, excuse me, of his government, and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish that. I would suggest to you this morning that true peace only comes from the Lord alone. Only peace that we can have with the world around us is a gift given to us from the Prince of Peace. The wars and conflicts that are raging, God will take care of it when he comes. He promised that when he would come, war would end. Conflict would end. It would be done and gone. I was reading this. When the, church, when the Christian church reads or sings these words, it is to exalt the gift of God's love in Jesus Christ. It is his song, and we sing it in thanksgiving for the, multi, for the fulfillment of that hope that burns in the weary human heart through centuries of darkness and pain. That God would yet visit and redeem his people. It has all come true. It has all come true. In Mons, uh, Belgium, was the first place that World War I started. It was the first place in the battle. And what happened was the Germans came in and occupied Mons. And as they were in Mons, they came and they forced the people to go into their houses and to keep a very low profile. They hid themselves for four and a half years in their homes. Yes, they go out to the jobs, but it was, you were defeated by the occupying armies of the Germans. Finally, on November 11th, 1918, the British pulled in and came in and pushed out the Germans out of Mons, Belgium, pushed them out on that day and on that great day. 
And the people came out of their homes as the last of the German soldiers left. They came out of their homes and they began to yell to one another, Hang out your flags! Hang out your flags. So they took the Belgian flag and they started flying it everywhere. And when you would look up and down the street as the sun had finally come up and during the day and you would see the Belgian flag because they were celebrating the great victory that peace had come to their town after being occupied by the enemy for so long, for so many years. Finally peace had come and they were free. And they rejoiced and be able to put up those flags. Well, you know, I am free, and I will speak my mind. And what I should say today, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the key to peace in our world. He is the key to peace in our families. He's the key to peace in our hearts. By inviting Christ into your heart, he can bring the peace that passes all understanding, the Bible says. If you are struggling and not at peace, and there's not peace in your home, I invite every member of that family to invite the Prince of Peace in. How do you do that? How do you invite the Prince of Peace into your home? By asking him, come in, come in. He will come in at your earliest invitation. He will come and be part of that. He will come and share. He has promised it to us. Which then therefore brings us back to the thanksgiving. And that is why I am thankful. That the peace that is coming can be ours now. In the future and forevermore. The Prince of Peace. Now there's a hymn in the hymnal. That I love. I love the words of it. And I would like for us to sing it together. It's an old hymn and has beautiful lyrics. Now, I have to remember, it's an old hymn. So it has kind of arcane language in it a little bit. But I would like for us to sing that together. You may know this hymn. If you don't, it's all right. You can just kind of follow along. And the words, notice the words that we sing. Now thank we all our God. Please try this with me as we sing together the first and second and third verse together. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things hath done in whom his word rejoices who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Come on, you can sing it now. Oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us with ever joyful and blessed peace to cheer us and keep us in his grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next last stanza all praise God, the Father now be.
be given. The Son and Him who reigns with high in highest heaven, the one eternal God, whom earth and heaven adore, for this it was, is now, and shall be evermore. Thank you. You see that hymn? You see the hymns in that, the words there coming back, all one eternal God with whom heaven adore, for this it was, is now, and shall be evermore forevermore, that great truth laid in that hymn for us because Jesus is the unspeakable gift. The gift. The gift. So I'm wondering what you may be thankful for today. You may be looking for many wonderful things around and be grateful for your family, for your job, or that you're in between jobs. You may be thankful for your health or hoping that God will heal you. You're thankful for the breath of life. You're thankful for the truth. You're thankful for them. But God's great unspeakable gift to us was his great grace in giving up his son that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. A great and gracious gift, and that is why today we are giving thanks We give thanks. Would you bow your heads with me as we do just that? Lord, I thank you for the great and gracious gift you have given to us through your son, Jesus. He is the mighty counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. In a world that does not know peace, in a world that does not know you, in a world that doesn't see that there's a way to have peace in their lives and to be free, They suffer and struggle, and as we leave these doors today, we will see that everywhere we go. But you have promised and are able to be the Prince of Peace in our lives today, and we look forward to the time when you will come. So we give thanks and rejoice to you in your great grace and mercy towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. And all the people said, Amen. amen.